But Rob, I want to take you back, back in time yeah. to 1983, I'm going to suggest. I was a school teacher in training at that stage, and I went to Baldwin High School to do my teacher training. And I handed out the maths homework that night. Note, maths, not math. Maths homework that night. I was advised by the teacher that was my supervisor, that young man over there, he doesn't do homework. And I said, why? And she said, oh, you don't know who he is? Well, I'll tell you who he is. He's on the radio now. Uh, Bevan Adensel, why weren't you doing homework for me in year nine? <laughs> well, I probably should have been. <laughs> Given that I was working 45 hours a week outside of school, which is 35, I didn't have a lot of time for it. Yes, you were given special dispensation because he's on Young Talent Time. Um, I don't know that it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what she told me. What the final product was, so yeah, never great. Um, but, uh, yeah, thanks for joining us all these years later. You can call me Neil. You don't need to call me Mr. Butler anymore, as you had to at that stage. Um, do now, though. <laughs> take, me, take me back. I got a vague recollection you came from Western Victoria. Does that sound right? Yeah, that's right. I came from a country town called Dimboola, you know, about halfway between Melbourne and Adelaide, um, in, the, in the Wimmera. Uh, do you have arm wrestles with Tim Watson to see who's the most uh, Im wow. impressive product of the village? Absolutely uh, mad Essendon reporter. So Tim Watson, Merv Nagel, uh, Peter Light, all came from Dimboola. I spent the day with Mark Harvey yesterday. He, um, he speaks very highly of all of those lads that come out of that neck of the woods. Absolute legends, yeah, absolutely. Uh, in, in fact, because Tim's a little bit older than me, um, but when he was, because uh, of course he started at the Bombers when he was 15, um, but he uh, came and gave the juniors at Dimble a, a training session once, and I'll never forget it. You know, you know my idol Tim Watson was training us so back in Dimble. That was fantastic. So we've got to get this out of the road early. So that uh, you and I were in, in Ball and High in 1983. Have Essendon won a final since then? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it had to be said. It was there. It was hanging out there to dry. <laughs> <laughs> no, they didn't. They, they were, got to the grand final in 83. Oh, that's right. They did too, didn't they? And then they were the next two premiers. And 84. Okay, yeah. And 85. Yeah, okay. No, bad joke. Blew up my face, didn't it? <laughs> um, Not three and 2000, but apart from that... Yeah, are we we're happy to talk about 2001? If you'd like to talk about that one, I was there. Um, <laughs> I'm a Lions man. So uh, so you, you, you're going to school in Dimbula. Obviously, you can sing and dance a bit. Uh, take us forward from there. Yeah, well, I... My, my, I, I loved sport and music. Uh, my dad was a musician. Uh, I was also very good at, at sport. And uh, I was uh, in the, the school cross country. And I, I ran that and won that. And then they went. we went to the, um, the, um, the you know, the, the regional, uh, yep. won that. And then we went to the all high and then came down for the Victorian Championships. And while we were down, we were staying at some friend's house, and this is from Dimboola, in Melbourne. Um... We were staying at some friend's house, and they had a piano in the front room, and I was, I played the piano terribly, but I was just having a, a play and a sing in the front room. And they had seen in the newspaper that John Young, uh, obviously the host and executive producer of Young Time, Tom, was looking for a new boy for the team. And uh, they showed my, my parents the clipping, and apparently my parents kept it. I didn't know anything about this at, the sta at this stage. And we were driving home. I, I ran my race. We were driving back to Dimbull, and my father pulled over to a phone box uh, in Sydenham on the way out of Melbourne um, and called the number and uh, he said look I think my son's got a pretty good voice can he get an audition and they said well we'll still audition 5,000 boys but if you bring him in now or see him as in now but like tomorrow so we went back to our friend stayed another night I went in had nothing prepared of course I'd never done an audition in my life um, and they said what do you know and I, I told them a few of the songs that I know and they said well here what, you know can you accompany yourself? And I said, sure. And I sat down and started playing. And I don't think I was in, into the song very long before they suggested uh, Greg Mills, the musical director, come down and play for me. So he, he did that. And uh, I sang a couple of songs. Like I think it's Still Call Australia Home was one of them. Um, and uh, when we went, they thanked me. We went back to Jimbula. Three days later, they called up and uh, Mum answered. And they said, he's got the gig. She said, when does he start? Uh, they said, now, he's already started to get down here. <laughs> they sold the house in Dimboola immediately for about $12.50, I think it was, <laughs> and then headed down to Melbourne, and uh, that was the start. And, of course, my first um, school in, in 
uh, in Melbourne was born high. Yeah, and I reckon that you had only just arrived. Um, I, I, you know, it was maybe your first or second week at the school when I rocked into your life. And, you know, I like to look back on the kids I've taught and taught them mathematics, and here you are as a musician. I obviously had a massive impact on you. Oh, you did. Look, you know, you have to count the bars. Oh, there is that. Yeah, so you can count to four. I'm good at that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Rob counts the bars, but there's the there's the one at the Cremorne, and there's the bar at the Commercial, and the bar at the Railway. That's the bars he counts. That's right. He's very good at the bars. Yeah, he's very, very good at counting them. Had a bit of experience, Bevan. <laughs> <laughs> well, until you get to the ninth one, and you've you totally lost count. <laughs> It doesn't matter by then, does it? Yeah, that's right. So, obviously, people... Uh, yesterday, I was in a, a workshop with someone, and someone said, oh, who are you talking to tomorrow? I said, uh, Bevan Adamson. Oh, yeah, who's he? And I said, Bevan, young Tom. Oh, my God, I had a crush on him. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, he's a lovely fella, too. And so, um, <laughs> he... he, uh, he she, no, she said, uh, oh, say hi from... I can't remember her name. But she was very excited. But So, you obviously became a household name, and presumably, your life turned... Because Dim Builder hasn't got a lot of action going on, I wouldn't have thought. It was turned upside down. No, 2,000 people in Dim Builder and, uh, um, you know, generally the, probably the best part of it is the road out. But um, all kind of beautiful um, childhood in Dim Builder. I loved it because, you know, as, once again, all the sport that you could muster and playing footy out on the road with the kids and, you know, I'm, I'm happy. But, yeah, life changes very, very, very quickly uh, in that span and... Um, you know, I was hyperactive, so I was, you know, I was a pain in the butt to the, the producers a lot of the time. They knew that my heart was always in the right place, and I, you know, never did anything intentionally wrong, but I couldn't sit still. So that was a challenge for them. Um, but I think it helped me get through the, the ridic- you know, the ridiculous hours because, of course, you can't do that now. So we, in 2012, um, they brought back, they tried to bring back Young Talent Time, and mm. I, um, along with a, a few of the original members, were on the very first show. I'll never forget, we we're, we're just rehearsed our part, and then the, the floor manager yelled out, OK, guys, we've got to get the next part done. Uh, we've only got eight minutes before we lose the kids. Oh, really? And, and I went, oh, well, I never heard that nap time. <laughs> <laughs> the rules now say they can only work a certain amount of time, which is, I think is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. But those rules were non-existent when I was in the show, so we just kept going until it was done. You know, sometimes we'd be at vocals on a Tuesday, Wednesday night up until midnight. You know, sometimes on a Saturday we we get to the channel and we're at 7am and we leave at midnight. Um, Then we'd be location shooting on Sunday because it was the only day available. So it was it was full on, but, you know, I wouldn't change it. I I loved my time on the show. I'm very proud of it. That's a very interesting point Bevan because in, in this day and age it would be probably regarded as child brutality but wh- when you're in the spotlight and you're loving it and it's all uh, so exciting you're probably not aware but but maybe when you think about it at the time y- you were probably being used and abused for television financial gain as opposed or, or sorry I shouldn't put words in your mouth or did you feel always that that organisation was out for your best interests? I always felt that, that they looked after us very well and they did care about us very, very much. Um, the fact is that we had a massive television show to produce weekly um, and it took a long time to do it. Um, but they always looked after me um, uh, and, and anyone that was in the show with you know, at my time. I can't speak for other times because I wasn't there. Uh, but I, I couldn't have asked more from them. Um, I guess that these days there's a little bit more awareness of of the you know the amount of time that kids can work and and for their their own benefit and their own health. I got pneumonia when I was in the team after uh, only a couple of months, and I think that would have been probably because of the amount that I was working. You know, um, but no, we were treated very very well, and at no stage felt used and abused. I guess the you know kids now they're they're going to school the same hours that you did you know start at nine finish at three thirty and then they go home and sit on the couch and pick up pick up their phone outside of your school hours what sort of hours a week were you doing forty five hours about on a on a sort of normal to busy week it's because you you would record the vocals for all the songs because we were dancing and everything we couldn't sing it live it could it would have been a disaster to try to get it right yep it's so we recorded all the songs. I mean, I, myself and Tina Arena were the only two that went through a period of doing our solos live vocal because we would walk into the um, 
into the studio and, and sort of record it in one take and walk back out again. So they went, well, we don't, why don't we just get them to do it live? We don't even have to pay for the studio. Mm. But we'd be, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday would be vocals after school. Um, then Thursday, Friday, we would do dance rehearsals. Now, vocals would go to any, anywhere up to midnight sometimes. Um, but generally, you know, probably 10 o'clock. Um, then we'd go home, go to school the next day, and then we would do uh, Thursdays and Fridays dance rehearsals with Maggie Burns and learn all the dance routines for the show. And we'd generally finish about 7.30, I reckon, um, you know, start at 4. Because, uh, you know, it basically, my parents would pick me up from school. We would either go straight to rehearsals or I'd race home, have a very quick shower, put some clothes on and head straight off to to uh, wherever we were going, whether it was vocals or, or rehearsals. And then Saturday we'd be at the channel quite early and we would, you know, do all the recordings and all the, the, the you know, the side filming and then do the show that night. Um, and that would be anywhere near, you know, anywhere up to tw- midnight by the time we'd leave. And then on Sunday, if, if there was any location shooting that had to be done, that's when we would do that. Generally, I got Sundays off, but I was in the team for three months before I got a day off. Wow, that's cool. extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I... I did some research for this program, Bevan. It's an unusual occurrence. That's how special you are. I actually went on to, on to what my father used to call the YouTube and found uh, an episode that featured you, and it was recorded at uh, Dreamworld. All right, yeah. Now, keep, keeping aside the fact that you're doing 45 hours a week, having to fly to Queensland to do Dreamworld and do all the stuff there, and it was obviously done during school holidays, but... You know, I guess that would just be complete immersion, those sort of sessions. Well, we did national tours, and that's and we, obviously we would do those in the holidays, but um, we loved the tours. I mean, we were, you know, we'd do a free concert, um, at, I think it was Albert Park in Brisbane, to, you know, 50, 60,000 people. Um, and then, you know, we would do five back-to-back at the Sydney Entertainment Centre, which is 13,000 each, each concert. So, I mean, it was huge. And, you know, you, I remember that, that Brisbane concert coming out. I, I remember the song I sang was um, I Want to Know What Love Is uh, by Foreigner. And I walked out, and we had thousands of watts of music, and I could not hear the music from the screaming of the fans. It was like the Beatles. So we went to... It was an incredible experience. Um, so for me, I so like, well, we, we used to love doing the concert tours because it was just so exciting, you know? Um, the, uh, the show ran for... 12, 15, eight, 17, yeah. 18, a yeah, long time. Uh, so lots of names and faces went through. By the time you come in, it's a, it's well-renowned, and there, there would be a lot of household names came through it. But um, yeah. do you still have the connections with any from, from your time, or have you just all gone your separate ways? No, I do, actually. In, in, during COVID in 2021, I co-produced uh, uh, the 50-year reunion because uh, Young Counts on Southern 71. I started in 83. Um, and by then it was a juggernaut, you know, the mm. five years of Young Tom Tom were the biggest as far as, you know, it was the huge, uh, not necessarily the best team. Uh, you know, I think that you, you look back at the, the, the first team and the, the teams earlier on and they were just so incredible with, you know, Debbie Burns, Philip Gould, Jane Scarley, um, you know, uh, Jamie Redfern, all those guys, just incredible. Um, and then, of course, you had Danny, uh, who's still one of my best friends in the world, Tina, um, and Joey Peroni, you know, Vince. I mean, there was a, a lot of um, talent right through the years. Um, but 18 years, you know, <laughs> it's uh, not many shows go that long. Um, but I produced the, the, the 50-year reunion, and I brought 28 of us back together. There were some people, uh, sadly two of our... Um, Young Tom Tom, all three now, but at the time of, of doing the reunion, uh, Bobby Dreesen, uh, sorry, Bobby Dreesen's passed since, um, but um, Julie Riles and Juanita Coco had passed, so uh, Karen Knowles and I sang uh, You'll Never Walk Alone did a tribute to them with all the, the, their footage in the background, which was really emotional, but it was beautiful to be back together, um, and you would not have thought a day had passed. It was. I mean, I was really busy because I was producing it, so I was sort of up and down. But every time I walked into where everyone was, they were all just had smiles on their face and there's hugs, and there was. It was really special, to be honest. It sounds a bit like a, a school reunion on steroids, I, I guess, because you yeah. spent so much time with each other. Yeah, well, we spent a lot of time with, more time with each other than we did with our school friends. 
and I just will back out of that and say there were no steroids involved, folks, in case I meant that in the nicest possible way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I absolutely don't. <laughs> so, so, Bevan, we, we've, we talk a lot here about um, uh, athletes in, the, in the, uh, the spotlight and then the world stops um, and there's nowhere to go. You've, you've had uh, somewhere to go after it. You're still, still singing. You're probably up and down a bit with your career. But for many, I suppose, it did stop uh, at, uh, straight after Young Talent Time. There was nowhere else to go or maybe no desire to go anywhere else. But I, I guess in amongst the group, and you'd have found out at reunion time, there would be many, many different outcomes from, from the time on Young Talent Time. Yeah, look, there, it really is, and it's very mixed. Um, of course, as we know, there's there's quite a few young time timers that are still perform and have made a very successful living. Um, there's others that still perform and you don't hear about them much anymore, as as much. And there's others that went on to, to wonderful other careers. You know, Courtney um, is, a, is a nurse. Uh, Vanessa is a, is a teacher in, in Brisbane. Um, and these are all really important jobs. And, and there's a lot of people say, oh, you know, you, you don't have a career anymore. It's like, well, not, wait, wait a second. Yes, they do. Yeah. It's just yeah. not in entertainment. And it's probably a more important career than we have. You know what I mean? So, um, but as kids, I think it would have been really hard for quite a few where it just stopped and then they had really nowhere to go. Um, I think it did, it, it, it probably hurt the psyche of quite a few of the the team members um, that was I felt really bad for the younger ones that had just got into young talent time. They're thinking, obviously, we know what's going to be my career. It's going to be amazing. And then young talent time gets axed in '89, and it's like, well, thanks guys, it's it's over. Mm. It's lucky. I, you know, Danny left two weeks before me. I left uh, three months before the show finished. So I had my farewell, and I went straight on into a musical theatre production, and then I became a pr- professional golfer and then um, realised that I'm a better singer than I am a golfer, and then went back to the singing. <laughs> um, and I've, I've sung, you know, I've owned the event company on Hayman Island for a decade, but I was all, I've always been in entertainment and, and you know, productions, and because and, uh, I didn't, you know, I produce things as well. But so for me, it's, 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 it's been fairly solid. I've never really been out of work. Um, but it is hard. It, it really is. Like right now, I've, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a, a really sought after show on on the cruise ships. I have two different shows, and um, if I open my my diary, I could be basically working every week of the year. But then I would never see my family. I'd never see my wife, my kids, my my friends. Uh, so that's got to change. And but it's 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 been harder than I thought. Even though I've got a really strong show and I sing better now than I ever have, it's it's tough out there to try to get the, that work. And I've just that's the, you, you, thank you for playing both sides now. It's, it, that's my new album um, that I've just produced. In fact, the CDs are on their way in the next week, um, but it's, it's available on my website. But it's, it's surprising. I, I thought it would probably have, have sold a little bit stronger when I first started. Um, and it's picking up now, but it was, it's um, really interesting talking with some of the really the, the true greats that have done, you know, been around so long in the entertainment industry. And I, what I've started saying when I do performances now is saying this, I'm not talking about me personally, but if you like somebody from the industry and you, you know, you've got wonderful memories of their music or something and they're still performing and they're doing a show somewhere, if you can afford it, and that's a big if because, you know, living costs a half for everybody, and you're sitting on the fence as to whether to go or not, please go. And the reason is because if you don't, they will not be able to do this anymore. There's yep. so many out there that are living gig to gig and trying to pay rent, and they're supremely talented. But there's so many too that uh, I know. I was talking to um, Andy Podger, a good friend of mine, who's a wonderful. He owns a piano bar in Geelong. Well, he does indeed. Yes. Uh, we love Andy. He's awesome. Um, and I do a lot of a lot of work with Andy. But he, um, we're talking about different names that we both know that are just supremely talented that are no longer in the entertainment industry because they couldn't make ends meet. And it makes it really sad, but it's, it's kind of that realisation to try to get out there to people and say, look, you know, we're not saying you have to go to a show, but if you're sitting on the fence and you love somebody's music and they're doing a show, try to make it a yes, because you may well be keeping them 
doing what they've loved, what they love, and what they've been doing for so many years. Yeah, it's a very good point, and I know Neil's been big on this, and he buys a lot of music. Uh, he goes to a lot of shows. I haven't for a long time, but last Saturday night, ironically, I went to a little town called Birragara to see Carice Eden, who was a, a oh. voice that that caught me at day one, and I've loved. And I went to see her live show, and she's just. Brilliant, and the same message, um, you know, we, we do what we do if you love it, but it, it's got to come at a cost if we're going to keep doing it, and I will try and do more of it. Yeah, well, even little things like this album, a lot of people have said, um, why, why isn't it on Spotify? So well, a lot of people these days will put albums out, it's, it's kind of like a hobby, where others are doing it for a living. Yep. Now, you know, I put it on Spotify, and uh, for a million listens, I'll get 700 bucks. Yeah, and that works really well for Taylor Swift, doesn't it? And that's about the extent of it. Exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we uh, we have a policy here. I didn't have a chance because you and I were running a little bit close to the wind this morning, but uh, we have a policy that if we're going to play an artist's song, we will buy the songs through the streaming service or whatever. So certainly once your album's out, let's know and whatever. You'll get a, a purchase from me because it's uh, it's important that we do that, folks. If you, if, you, if you stream, you're cheating. That's really what it comes down to. Yeah, yeah okay, Bevan gets you know, 0.007 of a cent if you play it, but... You know, these are people who are doing it for a living, as Bevan has said, and uh, get along to gigs is really important. I noticed um, that you did a gig, or just come off a series of two or three gigs in Byron Bay with a, someone called Benji Adamsell. That's funny. That's coincidental that they've got the same surname. Yeah, well, well, Ben is my eldest son, and he's uh, phenomenally talented. I mean, he's a much better piano player than I am. Um, I'd like to say that's, you know, because I taught him well, but <laughs> I really didn't. I, I taught him how to read chord charts at a, when he was about seven. And he's done the rest. Um, but uh, I was able to get him that, that gig, and he's doing uh, those in, at, the, at the Great Northern Hotel in, in Byron, and he's doing three or four a week, and I'm doing two with him. I'm actually doing two next week and, and two the week after. And then in between, they're flying him up to Darwin to do a dueling pianos um, uh, at Sweethearts in Darwin up, up there in between. So he's uh, getting a lot of work now, but uh, it was the first time a couple of weeks ago that we'd ever done a gig together. And it was just beautiful to be looking across at the other piano and seeing my boy there. For me, is something I'll never forget. Just such a proud moment. And he's got the room in the palm of his hand. And you know where it could be very easy because of my career and what I do to, to take over. It's so nice to, for me to just sit back and let him have the room because he does it so well. And I can just sit back as proud dad. And yeah. love that. The people in the room, and it's packed. They go nuts. But uh, the, the people in the room, I think, really love the fact that it's a father and son doing it because you don't really see that very often. Yeah, the closest we could probably come to that uh, is I, uh, I I batted once with my son um, in a game of cricket. and uh, Brilliant. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we played about 25 games together and we batted adjacent to one another in the batting order, but I was always the one that would go out. <laughs> and he, we, we met a lot of times walking on and off the ground. Um, yeah, right. Bevan, a very interesting story. You've, you've got a lot of strings to your bow. Um, is author going to be one of them? Because there's a book there. You know, a lot of people have said that. And I'm, you know, I, I, I grew up with chronic ADHD, and I'm terrible. I'll remember certain things and I forget things to the point where I have heard um, people say to me, I loved it when you sang blah, blah, whatever song on Young Time Time. And I go, what song? And then I'll, I'll look it up and I'll listen to it, the song, like by the original artist, and I think, I don't think I've ever heard that song in my life. And then I'll find the video of me singing that song. So, okay, so I... So I did. <laughs> busy, you know, it was like Goldfish. You had to learn something quickly and move on. And sometimes if the song didn't resonate with you, I don't, can't even remember that I did it. So as far as writing a book, I've had a lot of people say, you need to write a book, you've done so much. It's like, well, I don't even know where I would start. And I guess that's where you get a ghostwriter and you get somebody that knows how to put it all together. I'd start in Dimboola. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there must be a, a very hefty section on ball and high, of course. Oh, and, and the, specifically Year 9 Mathematics. Yes, definitely. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Who, who was that clown out the front well, trying to teach me mathematics? Clearly, clearly you failed, Bevan, because you didn't do your bloody homework. <laughs> I know, I know. But um, I went to Waddle Park after that because it was just a smaller school. Yeah. It, you know, that was my first year in Young Talent Time, and we didn't know coming from the country what it was going to be like. And then it just got too hard. Um, when I got to Waddle Park, I tell you, the thing that saved me, guys, is is was being strong at sport. Um, because you got, you know, the, the team members got teased because they're jealous kids. Kids are mean, right? Yeah. You know, uh, just 
they don't realise how mean they're being. Um, but because I would be in the the team, you know, the, the school footy team or the school cricket team or tennis or whatever, all of a sudden you're helping them win, yeah. and you become mates with the guys that generally are the jocks that would give you the big the hardest time, and I became friends with them. So I got, you know, new kids would come to the school and see that that's been some young time time and want to start, you know, teasing me or whatever, and then the guys would look after and say, no, you don't go near him. So I was lucky, but not a lot of the, the other members didn't have that. You know what I mean? So mm. Bourne Hall is quite a big school, so we went to Waddle Park because it was just, you know, it's only, I think, 300 kids. Yeah. So it was just a smaller place for me to be able to try to navigate. It's slightly close to Channel 10 too, I would have thought, out there in Nunnawadding. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, we moved house from Bourne to Surrey Hills. So. Ah, right. Yeah, a bit closer again. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Bevan, we've run out of time. We've been having a great chat, and I've just looked at the time and thought, uh, we better get going because we've got to talk to some other people. What an absolute thrill to catch up with you after all these years. Just to put that into context, Fine. that's 41 years ago that you and I stared across the desk at one another. Um, you said it's only 15. <laughs> let's see if we can uh, catch up before the next 41 years goes past because uh, I won't be around at that stage. No, I'd love it, guys. Anytime you want to have another chat, I'll be more than happy to. Thanks, Bevan. Congratulations on a wonderful career that's still going, and it sounds like you might uh, have produced another good one as well. Yeah, look, I would say, if you don't mind me just saying, too, if anyone does want to download my album, they can do now on my website. And my name, Bevan, is spelled like seven with a B. So B-E-V-E-N dot com dot A-U and they can download the, the album. No, you can't say that. No, sorry, we, we don't promote albums, but uh, no, we don't. I'm joking. Uh, Bevan dot com dot A-U, B-E-V-E-N dot com dot A-U. Uh, we've already heard one song, which we uh, was a duet with Shandell Cook. We are now going to hear the song that you sang on the uh, 50th anniversary. Uh, it is uh, You'll Never Walk Alone. Name, uh, no, not name of the album. Both sides now, name of the album. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Bevan. Bye, bye guys. Thanks, mate.